Ah, oh, mistress, you know that although I'm a sailor... With the woman in every port. Ah, uh, but I'm true only to you. If you see me wink my eye, two a wench is passing by. Though a wench is passing by, is not she? Is who? Is you. Be true. Mm-hmm. When I say me love me, dear. You are dashing privateer. You are calling him love and dear. Is not him. Is who? Are you? Be true. Mm-hmm. True only to you. Oh, true, true only, only to you. No, no matter, matter what, what I, I might, might do, do, what I, I do, do when I do it, only to you. If you see me walk and kiss, an enchanting little miss. Lord, enchanting little miss is not she. Is me. Lovers love to love and spoon Underneath the tropic moon All them lovers loving and spooning Is not them Is who? Is me? Is me and you? But Morgan, you can't go to Panama Oh, but why? I don't finish knit your socks Anytime I say I'm free For a man Good afternoon and welcome to week two of 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World. My name is Akiba Abaka and I am a co-founder and co-artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts. We're an international theater production company and we create plays, concerts, talks, and processes for plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. 10 Weeks in Jamaica is presented in collaboration with Raw Management Agency, an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups across all genres of film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. We are grateful for the support of Ms. Nadine Rollins, Raw Management's Managing Director, 
and a powerhouse connector of Jamaican theater, film, and everything in the arts. Ms. Rollins also served as a co-curator for our series. We are also thankful for the support of our publishers, HowlRound.com. HowlRound is a free and open platform of theater makers worldwide that amplifies progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and facilitates connection between diverse practitioners. We are also grateful for the support of the Martin E. Siegel Center at the City University of New York, CUNY. The Siegel Center is a home to theater artists, scholars, students, program uh, performing arts managers, and local and international performance communities. In this series, we link with our colleagues in Jamaica, the beloved island nation, cultural hub, and one of the vacation capitals of the world for 10 weekly, lively conversations about the subject of theater. Jamaica's theatrical legacy dates back to the 15th century and represents a diverse collection of stories about a people and its culture that have converged on the islands for over 400 years. A bit of a disclaimer before we start this afternoon. For those of you who grew up in Jamaica or have visited Jamaica at this time of year, you would know that it's rainy season in Jamaica. And so um, parts of the island is experiencing uh, a lot of rain. So during this conversation, we may experience some technical difficulties as a result of the rain. Um, if anything happens, we are prepared to carry on in the best fashion, uh, working with technology and the weather, Mother Nature. At this time, today's topic will focus on two great pillars of Jamaica's theatrical legacy and Jamaican culture in general, the Little Theater Movement and Miss Louise Bennett. We are joined today by an esteemed panel of speakers whose careers have been shaped by their engagements with the Little Theater Movement and Miss Lou. At this time, it is my honor to introduce to you Miss Faye Ellington, CDOD. Miss Ellington is a Jamaican media personality and lecturer best known for hosting the television series Morning Time on the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation for more than two, 12 years. In 1974, Miss Ellington joined the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, JBC, eventually hosting Morning Time for over two, a dozen years. She also served as one of the main news anchors on Jamaican radio and television for decades. In 2005, she made her directorial debut when she staged a one-woman show, Who Will Sing for Lena? She is currently hosting the program Profile on Television Jamaica. Ms. Ellington also started her career as an actress on the stage of the Little Theater Movement in the pantomime. Welcome, Faye. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So good to have you. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Anya Gludon Nelson. Ms. Nelson, Ms. Gludon Nelson is a graduate of Edna Manley School for the Visual Arts, now the Edna Manley College. She is a freelance graphic artist producing print and web-based artwork for various organizations and companies with a particular interest in behavior change and social issues. Anya is a board member of the Little Theater Movement she is an integral member of the production team with responsibilities for managing and coordinating the activities of the pantomime company. Her involvement in the Little Theater Movement began as a costume designer for the 1991-92 production Mandea, as she has continued for more than 20 other pantomimes. She has been recognized by the Actor Boy Awards, Jamaica's highest uh, critic circle award, with several nominations and an award for best costume design for the 2003-2004 pantomime, Miss Annie. She also serves as archi archivist and public relations 
and social media manager for the Little Theater Movement. She is responsible for the content and creation on the Pantomimes website. And to learn more about the pantomime, you can go to ltmpantomime.com. Welcome, Anya. Hi, nice to be here. So great to have you. Our next panelist is Dr. Deborah Hickling Gordon. A communic Ms. Dr. Hickling Gordon is a communication and culture and development strategist and commentator. Dr. Hickling Gordon has been involved in cultural and creative industries and tourism as a researcher, policymaker, and practitioner, having worked across the disciplines of integrated marketing, communication, broadcasting, and theater for 30 years. She is a director in several private sector companies, including Inc. and Vision Limited, facilitators of cultural and creative industries projects. She, is, she coordinates the UE Mona, the University of the West Indies at Mona, Bachelors of Arts in Cultural and Creative Studies, and the Bachelors of Arts in Entertainment and of Caribbean Studies at UE Mona. Dr. Hickling Gordon also su supervises graduate studies, coordinates and delivers postgraduate courses in cultural studies and at the Mona School of Business and Management. Deborah holds a PhD in cultural studies with that focus on transnational media and cultural economy. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you very much. So, our series will focus on the history and the experiences and the vision of the Little Theater Movement. And as such, I'd actually like to start off with um, a question for Anya. Your entrance into the Little Theater Movement happened in vitro, is that right? That is correct. I was actually in the belly. My mother is Barbara Boudon, who um, has authored several pantomimes. And she was actually working on a show called The Witch, which was based on the White Witch of Rose Hall. And I was in the belly for her working on that. And after my entrance, I've been backstage ever since. And you've been more than backstage. You've been coordinating all of the activities and running the, the program, essentially, um, both technical and um, in the archives of the Little Theater Movement. Tell us a bit about how the Little Theater Movement came to be. Who were Greta and Rita Fowler? Okay, so Henry Fowler and Rita Fowler, at the time she was Greta Burke. Um, they were both teachers at the Priory School, which was a kind of expatriate um, school where a lot of um, expatriates sent their children. So they had connections with Britain and British history and such, and they wanted to hearken back to their earlier days and have a little fun at Christmas. And so they wanted to stage a Jamaican pantomime. Mm -hmm. So they put together their money. And I think her, her sister, Rita's sister, gave her some money towards that. And they pulled together this script, which was Jack and the Beanstalk, because it was very traditional British type pantomime. And they staged it at the Ward Theatre. It did very well. And it became a decision that they would do this every year. And uh, since 1941, December, 26 Boxing Day, 6 p.m. since 1941. Every year there has been a pantomime on stage. It further went on to become more Jamaicanized when um, Louise Bennett Coverley, the Honorable Louise Bennett Coverley, and Granny Williams and a couple other Jamaican names who uh, persons may know, decided that it really had to reflect more of who we are as a people, who the society was at the time. This was still before independence, so it was a kind of point between pre-colonialism and well, post-colonialism <laughs> in the middle of that, as we're beginning to find ourselves as a Jamaican people. So they began to Jamaicanize the stories. They brought in a Nancy. They brought in the folk songs. So the songs that the people sang going to market, the songs that they sang at nine nights, what they, the words they spoke to each other, the proverbs that they told, the stories they told, those were all woven into the stories of the pantomime so that it could be a reflection of who we are as Jamaican people. And this is how it has developed over the years, which are a reflection of just who we are. It's, it's Jamaican culture, the culture we want to be, the culture we are, and the culture we aim to be. 
So after about, um, so they, this has been going since 1941. And um, so every year it is done. We have, they've had many different authors and creative persons throughout the years. It's reading a list of who has been involved in the pantomime is like a list of Jamaica's creative history. So uh, you had Albert Huey doing sets in the background and he's one of our famous creative uh, artists. You would have um, Colin Garland, who's another great Jamaican artist also doing um, are the, back, the sets and the backdrop and the costumes. Then you had the musicians. They primarily drew from the Jamaica military band. So that formed the basis of it, but then it grew from there and other Jamaican musicians came into, into the, the fold. So persons may know Grub Cooper from Fabulous Five Band. Grub is an integral part of the music scene with the pantomime. He has been musical director for many years. He's created many of the songs. The wonderful, late, great um, Noel Dexter, uh, founder of the co-founder of the University Singers. He was also very integral in shaping the sound of what the pantomime was. Marjorie Wiley, who worked with NDTC, um, has also assisted with the pantomime. I think she was on stage as well for one or two, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, persons like Professor Rex Nettleton, creator of the NDTC, he both wrote, um, danced in, directed, co-directed pantomimes in the past. So it's really like an amalgam of all of Jamaica's foundation creative people. And, um, and upcoming ones too, because we've made it our intention to make sure that the new, the new upcoming talent is allowed to come on stage, to be a part of the history. So that a student who is currently at Edna Mandy College can walk along the same path that Oliver Samuels walked along, Leonie Forbes walked along, Charles Hyatt walked along. So we've made sure that this continuity is happening making sure that we also remember who they are and what they did. So each year as we produce what we're doing, we hearken back to what was before and meld it and shape it into what should be happening now. So we always make sure to include parts of our traditional culture, whether it is folk form or songs or music or just um, tidbits of things that are typically Jamaican, whether we speak about um, pudding, which is pudding, a baked sweet treat, which is a, a classic for Jamaican people. We don't eat cake, we eat pudding. And so, you know, we, we build a scene and a song around that so that people can feel a part of their history and their culture when they come to say a pantomime. So it's really an embrace of Jamaican culture and community. That's, that's really what the pantomime is, was, and will continue to be. You know, as, thank you so much, Anya. Um, as we started off the, street, the program this afternoon, our viewers were able to get a taste of the sound of the Jamaican pantomime, the song that played All A We Are One from uh, the very critically acclaimed August Morn. Um, and when we talk about the history, today's conversation is themed decolonizing pantomime, the little theater movement and Miss Lou. When we talk about the history, Jamaica's history represented in this art form and this notion of decolonizing or reclaiming or laying claim to. Um, I think about August Mon because tell us a little bit about that production um, and then we'll go to um, a different question. Sure, um, August Morning is a, is a very special work. It, it came about in 1997 the Jamaican government decided that we should return Emancipation Day, which is the recognition of the day when they read the Freedom Proclamation that freed the slaves in 1834, although we still had apprenticeship up to 1838. But the August 1, which we refer to as August morning, was returned to our national calendar. So we needed a way to celebrate it, to bring awareness to it, because there was a a generation of persons who didn't really know what August 1 was, as well as there were others who thought August 1 was about the Queen's birthday or something to that effect. So it was important for us to link it to our particular cultural history. So with that, um, Barbara Gludon and director Brian Heaps came together. They drew pieces of um, poetry from persons like Philip Sherlock, um, who drew on songs from Peter Tosh, and we wove this story together about a group of runaway slaves who escaped into a cane piece because Freedom was coming and they had to see the sunrise and feel that they were free. So it's built around that. So it's part of our cultural history. And what that formed was, this wasn't particularly a pantomime, although it was performed by the pantomime company members and it was a pantomime and LTM production. It became part of what we would then refer to as our heritage series, which looks at pieces of Jamaican history 
persons in Jamaica who are important to us and we craft it into our work on stage. We put in our regular music. It has our little fun and laughter. And that production ran for 10 years unbroken. So from 1997 straight up to 2007, we did it without fail. Different cast members coming in at different times. And there were persons who literally grew along with us. And since then, every time they said, so when is August morning? It doesn't matter what we do after that. Whatever that show is, it's always referred to as August morning, which is fine because it still draws on our cultural heritage, whether it's, it's looking at the national heroes because we have another work that does that. So that kind of thing is how we build not just the fun, but let them learn something. And I know they use the term edutainment, but sometimes that sounds a little too stiff for me, but it's, it's, it's just absorption of knowledge while enjoying it. So you don't really know you're learning, but you learn something when you're done. And that's really what the, the focus was with August Morning. We're gonna teach you about who you were when you were enslaved and how the Jamaican spirit of, no matter how hard it is, you take Kinti Kiba heart bone, which means we take the challenges and the hurts and we turn it into a joke because it's far easier to laugh at our pain and to just wallow and cry at despair, you know? So that's all this morning. Thank you. So earlier you talked about some of the great luminaries of the Jamaican culture, um, cultural canon who emerged from the Little Theater Movement stage. And one of those luminaries is on our, is on our panel this afternoon, Miss Faye Ellington. I'm gonna try my best to call you Faye, but the <laughs> miss is gonna, is gonna stay there. Um, <laughs> so you are a young, young woman, come no. country, come to town, Cla from Clarendon to Kingston. How did you end up at the Little Theater Movement? I'm gonna tell you this. I came to Kingston when I was nine plus because of asthma. And where I'm from in the hills of Clarendon when the valley was cold. And so I was sent to K Kingston, which was warm. And while I was attending St. Hughes High School, my interest in the performing arts took me to being a member of the choir, a member of the orchestra, uh -huh, a member of the debating society of which I became president and a member of the drama society. And at that time, there were productions that would be done by St. Hughes or a collaborative effort between Kingston College, our brother's school, and St. Hughes. And I remember watching a production being done, The Crucible. And I just sat there and said, wow, you know, but because I've been performing, doing th the things. And when I left St. Hughes High School, I went to the Little Theatre Movement because they had started classes, the Jamaica School of Drama, long before there was an Edna Manley College. And before that, there was a cultural training center. But it was, it was when it first started, under the auspices of the Little Theatre Movement. So you'd go to work in the days, and then after work, you come for classes in the evenings. And we had some wonderful tutors, people like the late Wycliffe Bennett, Leone Forbes was one of our tutors, Bobby Gisses, lots of interesting, knowledgeable people. So some of the students who were there at the time as foundation students were Oliver Samuels, oh yes, Ruth O'Shing, uh, E. Lloyd Napier, Michael Everett, all of us, uh, Claudia Robinson, and many more. And so we got wind that Trevor Rowan had written a pantomime and uh, called Music Boy. And Oliver, myself, and Ruth, we tried everything because as students, we're not allowed to perform in commercial productions, whatever that meant. And so what we lobbied, and of course, Oliver and uh, led the way primarily, and we got accepted in the pantomime. Can you believe it? So I guess- Everyone is the same I'm going to, who wrote The Harder They Come and Smile Right, I'm just going to put wow. it, can you believe it? Trevor Rohn is the writer of The Harder They Come, co-writer that is. He was the writer of Smile Orange, wow. right? And he wrote this thing. And then furthermore, wow, we were going to be on stage with His Lou and Mass Ran and Ines Hibbert and Fitz Ware and so many others. Well, we are in our element. But, you know, Anya said that the first pantomime was 1941. My first pantomime was 1971. By then, the color, and I mean that in every sense of the word, had changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we were looking at Jamaican stories, and we we're telling them with passion and confidence, and people like Trevor Rohn would be writing these things, and the directors would have come, and, you know, they're directing, and but lots of things happened between 1941 and that time. But the, the story and, and, and the way it was written, the way it was directed, and the group, we learned so much by just being around those uh, senior actors and actresses. And so there we were in Music Boy. There we were watching and observing and learning and just becoming a part of what is now history. But I just wanted to 
add something to what Anya said. The political movement in this country, Jamaica, the, when you're in a political movement like we were, or any countries, that you're looking for your own identity. So coming out of colonialism, what it was is that you're looking for your identity, the political identity, your cultural identity. And if you really examine it, they're working together. Mm -hmm. 1941, the first pantomime, but before that, 1938, the riots, right? This is for people to be paid properly and to workers to be treated, labor riots. So we have 1941. Then we have 1944 in Jamaica, universal adult suffrage, when people were allowed to vote. Now, prior to that, if you didn't have money and land and color, white, you couldn't vote. And then we started working on self-government and coming up to independence in 1962. And so you see the work of the artists, the performing artists, the writers, the people in the cultural arts, working along with what was happening in the on the political landscape because it was all about identity identity mm -hmm. and before mm -hmm. i let me allow you to bring our other presenter in but let me say this with identity is language language so we were now using the jamaican language and feeling proud of it and not having people tell us it is broken english because it is not or looking down on us so they Trevor Rohn's plays, right? He has uh, uh, three plays in, in one book, uh, Smile Orange, Old Story Time, and I think School's Out, but a wonderful playwright, producer, director. So that's how I started, 1971. And my goodness, that just opened up doors for me. For my, 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 I did four pantomimes, but then my life as a performer, as an actor, took off. Thanks to those early beginnings with classes at the Little Theater Movement, and all the persons who taught me, and then getting that opportunity to get on stage in 1971 with Music Boy. May I just say this? Whereas prior to the Music Boy pantomime, and I don't think it has ever happened since, there was an orchestra pit because the ward theater is where pantomimes used to be done. And this is a theater, if you go to the West End in London, it's the same design, a, re a real theater with a proscenium arch and all of that. So there's an orchestra pit and the players and musicians will stay there. For Music Boy, there was a live band on stage. It was real life, and that was a Boris Gardner happening. Amazing, amazing. What a picture you paint. <laughs> and thank you for the timeline, talking about some of the social political unrest from 1938, leading us to independence in 1962. And then also talking about the significance of a move out of colonization and into a cultural and national identity being centered in language, mm -hmm. being centered in our um, identity, our culture from different parts of the, the island, our African culture. One person was very, very um, significant in moving that um, movement forward. And it was Miss Louise Bennett Coverley. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hickling Gordon, you, like Anya Gludon, entered the theater in vitro. And also as a child, essentially, of the work and the storytelling of Miss Lou. Tell us about your childhood experiences or, or your entrance into the little theater movement, and then also your experiences with Miss Lou. So it started long before um, I, I entered the Little Theatre Movement in 1991, 41, 71, 91. <laughs> okay, I'm, I know what numbers to go play, okay? I'm going to line them up. <laughs> my, um, my, my entire family was involved in theatre and theatrics, and, and um, my grandmother was a, a music teacher, and she and um, Lois Kelly uh, Barrow Miller, were very, very good friends. Um, and um, Barbara Gludon, and there was an, actually an entire crew of them, Norman Ray, um, Pauline Stone Mary, and you know, they would have these huge parties and excitement at each person's house. How they would go from one house to the next, and they would have these huge things. It was one person on Christmas Day, one person on New Year's Day, one person on, and so on. So I grew up going to all of these parties with all of these lesbians. So there was that, um, and 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 then there was a, when I went to St. Andrew Prep, the first thing I can remember, I remembered after we, we spoke the other day, my actual entrance into theater was through a pantomime at St. Andrew Prep um, mm -hmm. in 1981, 
Yes. <laughs> Oh, um, I, I call called Jack and the Gungo Tree. Now that's I'm important. Write that one down too. <laughs> <laughs> Jack and the Gungo Tree, written by um by Barbara Gludon. Anya was behind me at prep school. Anya was in my my sister's year, and um I, I Bobby Clark of Blessed Memory was the was the was the um was the director. My memory of that was I, we heard that there was going to be a pantomime, and I was I had just um past my common entrance to go to Queens. And I remember I was the first person in the hall to go and audition for this thing. And I wanted to, and I knew I was going to play the lead because I was so into theatre. And I did the audition and I did well and I felt great about it. And I came back the next day and Mr. Clark, this wonderful debonair, good looking young man at the time, um, said to me, you've gotten a part, you've got a great part. And I said, great, I've got the lead. And he cast me as Oink Oink the Pig. <laughs> I was a portly little girl. <laughs> and my mouth dropped open and I wept for days on, upon hearing that I, I was cast as Oink Oink the Pig. And I went home and my mother said to me, you're going to play the grunts of that pig. Mm -hmm. And... The rest is history. <laughs> As it, it, you were brilliant. Really, I did. Right? It was great. It was great fun. <laughs> so, what I, you know, thank you for sharing that story. I want listening to um, your stories of the the pantomime. Tell us about the elements of the pantomime that has made it so successful in Jamaica, as far as being able to be. Um, accessible to people of multiple generations from your perspective? Okay, so there are a number of things. First of all, there was this thing that um, that's still done called topicalities. Uh, so it was an opportunity for, for, for the, the um, lead to explore the issues of the day and the writers to explore the issues of the day. Um, and what would happen is that while the set was being changed, a, uh, a curtain would come down in front. So the, the, the lead would play front of curtain and they would have a discussion with people in the audience. So there was always some, but you talk about interactive now, we have it, we're in the digital age. That was the beginning of interactive, yeah? Mm -hmm. And they, and 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 um, Oliver did it well. And Lenford Salmon did it at, at a point. Anybody, Carl Binger. And there were, you know, the, in, they, they traded insults and they had discussions. So that was an important part of, of the pantomime. Another linkage to the pantomime um, that I wanted to bring up when, when, when Aunt Clea was talking is the notion of, of the issues of politics and topicalities. One thing that we need to remember, and just to bring in Miss Lou, that Miss Lou wasn't in, involved in a movement at the time in the 1940s, not, I mean, way before I, I came to the process, um, called Jamaica Welfare. Mm -hmm. And Jamaica Welfare was a movement started by Norman Manley. And he, he got a number of people who had been trained in a number of different areas and got them involved in social work. And they went through the highways and byways of Jamaica. They brought language and identity. And, you know, they, 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 they harvested stories as well as they um, told stories and got people to, rem you know, to remember who they were. And again, this is the 1940s, um, 1930s, 1940s, when identity was a huge part of that process. So all of that was woven into this process of the development of the pantomime right up to when I joined the pantomime movement in 1991. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and another thing that was important to me as we move forward on the timeline was I joined the, the pantomime. I was a, a student at UTEC. I was a business student having done very well at high school in, in drama. I decided I wanted to be a, 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 an actress. And of course, the pantomime would have been the first port of call. And I went to UTEC to, you know, kind of say to my father, I'm going to school. But I decided after a while that I couldn't take the maths and I couldn't take the accounts and I couldn't take the, the thing. And I went to him and I said, I'm going to join the pantomime. I'm leaving school. And so to my surprise, he said, okay. I think he was trying to psych me out. But I said, okay, you said, okay, I'm going. And I joined the pantomime, but I had to also um, get a job. That was, that, that, 
that is he said that in, if I'm going to leave school, I have to get a job. And I got a job in an advertising agency called Here's a Penny. So for me, what was very important, and in hindsight, I, I'm now able to say that that was the point in, 90, in the 1990s when we were starting to transition to this thing that we now call the creative industries and mm -hmm. the creative economy. So there, that was when we started to fight this balance or started to create this balance between the issues of identity and the issues of business and commerce. Right. We haven't quite won the war yet. Um, there's still a lot of tension and contestation about how we should do this or whether we should do this or why we should do this. What's the philosophy of it? What's the ideology of it? But Essentially, we were going through another element of, of what I call the process of change. Mm -hmm. So I, I, um, I always argue that we, we always say that, um, especially those of us who are older, and I, I'm guilty of it when I, you know, I'm teaching, we say, well, it was this and now it's this. But we are not necessarily going through the process of explaining to people how and why things changed. Right. Um, what was it in 1948 when Louise got up and said, you know, I'm not doing any more of these English pantomimes. And it's been since 1941 and I'm really, we're not doing this. And she and, and Ran decided, okay, and Mr. Vaz, Noel Vaz decided, we're gonna change the paradigm now. And that was, that, that was the beginning of a process of decolonization. And when we talk about decolonization, we're talking about a process. It's not something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's going to come today for tomorrow. It's not gonna happen because we see it. It's a process that's going to happen you know, over a period of time. So that for me, I suppose if you plot it along the timeline, 1941, 1971, 1981, 1991, right up to 2001, <laughs> then you'll be able to see that process of change. And it's always, always linked to our political history yes. and always linked to the issues of the time. And um, there's a lot that can be said about that issue of decolonization, but I'm sure we're gonna talk come to that a little later. You know, going right into this conversation of de the issue of decolonization, you, you know, when we, in the States, um, we are decolonizing everything in theater. I go to conferences, I'm at work and decolonize everything. And, you know, being a child who is from a country that was a colony a little bit earlier, uh, closer than the US, the US was a colony a longer time ago than Jamaica. When I hear my colleagues talk about decolonize, I said, well, what exactly does that mean? Are you trying to say decentralize whiteness, decentralize white supremacist culture? Is that what you mean? But what do you mean by decolonize? Is it just to move us all into the theater as people of color or where is our identity? Where is our voice? So one of the reasons we're doing this series is because, to be honest, you and Jamaica have, I wouldn't say figured out, because um, Dr. Gordon, Hicklin Gordon, you're correct that it's a process, but you're further along in the process when it comes to this question of decolonizing and our identity. And I just, please, Jump in, and then I, I wanted to bring up another part of this I, conversation. I, I think it's depend it, that depends on where you sit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've had a long history of the process of decolonization from the, from before the Pan African movement through negritude and um, through you know the, the, all of the political history that we've been through the sixties and seventies, where we had another golden era of thought and and, and literature. But it's it's a little bit, to me, for me, it's a, there's a bit of a contradiction taking place because once we went into the era of, neo, of neoliberalism and globalization in the 1990s, it seems to me that the process of decolonization in Jamaica started to become 
the word that comes to my mind is retarded, but um, it's not necessarily the right word. It, start, it started, we started to move backwards from this issue of, of decolonization as we got into the issue of, 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 of making money and, and, and subsistence and staying alive and keeping the theaters open and um, creating things that were commercially viable. So there was less and less of this notion of, of, of the colonial imperative, which is a part of our DNA. Now, that's not an indictment. It's just, it's a thing that happened along the process of change. So um, when you say we got it all worked out, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I agree with you that we have it in our spirits and we will, and there are those who will continue to fight the fight. But it moved a little bit more from, you know, creating an epic to finding theater space that we could afford for right. a run of three weeks. So a lot of the, a, a lot of the, the, the issues around theater and theatrical process began to change and decolonization started to take on new meaning. But for me, the um, notion of decolonization means this. It means that we make our decisions and we make our own decisions as to how we're going to get this thing done in the process of sustainably and as a process of development. It is decolonization by its very definition is undoing the effects of colonialism and neocolonialism. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that we are gonna decide, we're gonna work out collectively um, in the 21st century. So we're not talking about 1960s decolonization mm -hmm. or 1970s decolonization, which was a horse of a different color. We're talking about 21st century decolonization. I call it D2K. And um, and it's, it's about decide. And I think the cultural economy is becoming central to that process. That process is about, um, Restarting the groups that um, that 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 the um, labor organizations, the unions, the representative organizations. It's about collaboration. It's about doing things. I think decolonization is something like what Chris Daly has done. He has found a space and he has built a theater. There were more theaters in the 18th century in Kingston than there are in Kingston in the 21st century, and so that's a retardation. <laughs> it's kind of a, a step back as we became more yeah. and more familiar. You know, uh, connecting it back to the language, connecting connecting what you're saying to the language and the ability to claim space in the narrative of one's identity or one's cultural narrative. Um, we talk about a term called smadiization. Smaditization. Yes. Smaditization. Yes. Or smadification. It's you know, there's a smadification. Yes. <laughs> there's a famous poem. Um, well, it's actually, I, I used to recite it as a poem, but it was a speech. And it was by a speech given by um, Sojourner Truth at the, um, the women's uh, suffrage, one of the suffragist meetings. Um, and it's and I and ain't I somebody, right? And it you know the poem well the speech I, I always call it a poem, but the speech uh, in the speech she's saying you know everybody's talking about give women these rights and treat women this way, but what about me as a black woman? Ain't I somebody? And ain't I a woman? And um, so I wanted to go into going back to between 1941 and 1948 when Miss Lou is um, in some ways putting up resistance at the, at the pantomime and saying, well, let's talk about th this, this language. Let's enter into, into my language and how I speak and what I hear at the Nineites. And for those of you all who are not um, Jamaican or Caribbean, a Nineite is actually um, a gathering to celebrate one, one deceased loved one, um, nine nights typically after they've uh, passed on or within nine nights after they've passed on. And these are, if you really want to experience Jamaican culture, you want to find one of them. We call them a setup. <laughs> in fact, they do some, uh, they, they're, they're, a, they're a lot of fun. And um, 
there's something to experience. And you can understand if you've experienced a setup, you can understand why so much of it explodes in our culture from reggae to the stage to film and so on. But talk to me about smutty, smutty, smuttyization. I'm somebody, smutty, smutty eyes. Tell me about that. Smuttyization. Or yes. smuddy, it's 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 either smuditization or smuddification. So a gentleman by the name of Charles Mills, I believe, um, coined the term uh, in in his discussion about the uh, society, culture and society, and of course Rex Metalford ran with it uh, as he as he and Rain started to come down. Um, as, as, as he started to look at issues to do with um, identity and culture. And of course, we know that Rex Nettleford, for Rex Nettleford, the notions of identity and culture were deeply steeped in cultural institutions like the NDTC, the National like the JBC, like the, like the library, like, um, like Little Theatre Movement. All of all of which he had, you know, a, a hand in, and um, and basically he his, his notion was that we had to be able to create these institutions, um, which are largely voluntary or of, of um or by the government, um, through which we were we were to enable and empower uh, a Jamaica the, the, the emerging Jamaican people because he he he. He was around at the time and was integral in the independence movement and the free independence movement and the university and so on. And all of those things were part of that the decolonization of that time. And it was about making people into people, um, creating, making people feel like human beings, mm. dignity, words like dignity. And 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 um and so on and and Anya and 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 yes, can tell you about sure. the characters that were developed at that time to do just that. I think how, I want. To how did that show up in performance? At, pardon me. How, how did yes? Go ahead, please. Go I wanted ahead. to just uh, for a brief while speak. Smuddy in Jamaica is a word meaning somebody. Yes. I somebody. think we needed to say that for those persons who are non-Jamaican. So smuddy. What well, that smell is long over there, so that person sitting over there, right? And so that is where this is coming from because it's very real and it's very personal and it, and it, it, it comes to your core, to your soul. And so, as Tanya, as um, Debbie says, Professor Rex Nettleford ran with anything that meant identity and that was positive, and he would have worked with that um, both in his academic work and on the stage of the National Dance Theatre Company, what he brought. Now, he was like, perhaps the only vice chancellor of any university anywhere in the world was, who was also the artistic director of, the, of a National Dance Theatre Company. So you see what is happening here. A Rhodes Scholar, he studied at Oxford as well. So he was able to look at the entire scenario. He, he was strong on culture. He understood the history and why we were where we are. So he would have understood Miss Lou and what Miss Lou did. But may I just quickly say that we cannot have this discussion and not speak about the work of Marcus Mazaya Garvey. Absolutely. So Garvey right. was not just a Pan-Africanist, but he was also a performer. And I think I want to bring Anya in here because Anya, you know about it as well. So talk a little bit about it so we don't seem as if we're hogging the show. <laughs> what? what uh, I'm going to go back one step for you with the decolonization. And it came to me that decolonization happened even while they were still colonized. When they taught the slaves in church to sing, shall we gather at the river? And we broke it into our tones and said, shall we gather? We gather at the river. Beautiful, beautiful river. That is what happened. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It was the way for them to claim, okay, you taught us this song, you taught us this language, but we're going to break it into our way. We're going to make it ours. We're going we're gonna to work it and turn it so it fits our tongue, it fits our mouth, it fits our soul. And that's pretty much the kind of thing that 
that Gabby also believed into because he believed very strongly in understanding who you are and understanding your power and understanding your worth. And it tracks back to the pantomime in the sense that Ronnie Williams was a part of a troupe that performed at Edouise Park, which was a, a kind of cultural center, which is on um, Slipe, and Road in, Slipe Road in Kingston. And he would- I mean, I'm just gonna just contextualize a little bit of who Ronnie Williams, because we're talking about Miss Lou and we're talking, we're, we're naming some very, very important figures here. And Ronnie Williams was a, uh, what I call a journeyman actor, a, a real man of the stage. And if I were to put him in context, I would say in some ways he's um, similar to Burt Williams, mm -hmm. um, the Renaissance, the vaudeville, um, African-American vaudeville Renaissance, Harlem Renaissance actor, um, Burt Williams. Um, mm -hmm. So just wanted to provide that context. Yes, continue. Sure. And, right, so he was part of the troupe that, and he would have to organize the concerts and these concerts would have elocution. They would have elocution concerts, which, um, contest so that you would stand up and who gave the best speech. Um, they would have music, they would have drama. Um, Garvey himself wrote a song that we used in, a, in a, a, one of our summer productions, which was called Keep Cool. Um, so he was, Garvey, as you said, was in fact a performer when he made, when he made himself larger than he was because he was a short man. But when he spoke and that song came billowing out and the, the, the intensity in his words, if you've, if you've listened to any recordings and he speaks with this rapid fire delivery, which yeah. kind of gave a sense of urgency, but it wasn't like um, it wasn't like he was running away with the message. It was like I just have to get it all out, and I need you to hear it. And if it comes at you rapid fire like that, something must get in. And so that linkage of of Gavi to to the performing arts and the performances. So Rani was a Gaviite. He was that was part of who he was. But that that kind of sense of understanding who you were was also is, was also very strong in Miss Lou as well because when she went away to England to study and she had to deal with um, the English situation, which was well, it is what it is, um, <laughs> but it was what it was and still is what it was and is. Um, and she came back and she realized that it was even more important for our people to have a sense of value. For what they have. So there was no shame in singing Hagin Ami Koko Aruto Miminti. There's no shame in that. You can sing about the fact that your neighbor's pig is playing around in your garden and causing a problem. There's nothing wrong with singing that because you're singing what? Heidi, Heidi, ho. I mean, fiddly. literally and figuratively. Yeah, right. right. So, I mean, it was a sense of her saying that, okay, this is ours. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, as she would say, is a good, good something? This is something that you can hold on to and become part of what is important to who you are, which links back to Debbie's point about how we are beginning to understand what the creative industries are. And although she says she sees that the, the process might have slowed down and is kind of heading into retrograde, it's also shifting a bit because I'm, I'm a little amazed at how in this, in this middle of this pandemic, little part of Americans have jumped onto TikTok like you would never believe. They are creating content. They're making people see what we are about, what we're doing. There's a new story and they're regurgitating it and reworking it and showing us their particular style. They're working it with, they're working it in with, with, with things that are cultural and contemporary. And it's, it's a sense that we might not be working along a particular structure or we might not have identified how that structure is actually going to work together, but they're still doing it. And sometimes we need to realize that sometimes we don't even know the changes are happening. We don't even know how it's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same process, but I wanted to say the same process of change. I wanted to say, Anya, just to link back, and we, we're jumping back and forth so that we can get a Edward White's part, um, Dad was ahead of his time too in thinking through that right. he was clear that we had to have our own spaces. We had mm -hmm. to own our spaces and we had mm -hmm. to be able to do business in those spaces. Mm -hmm. That was not just about the performative. It, there was very much an economic imperative in there and he was very clear about the notion of, of personhood having to do with making a livelihood as well. So, I mean, so. 
Very much so, Debbie. But I want to bring something else about Rani into the picture. That's Rani Williams or Mass Ran. So yes, he was his own person, but he worked on stage in several pantomimes with Miss Lou. As a matter of fact, many persons thought they were married. But in addition to that, Mass Ran, he was a total performer because he was part of, um, a, a, what was the name of the, the, the um, performance group that he was part of? A gentleman, himself and another man. Huh? Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy. But yeah. he was he also had his radio programs at the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation. And when you spoke about topicalities earlier on, he was the first person I saw really master the art of topicalities, front of stage at the World Theatre. And on top of all this, listen to this, Masran either owned or managed a John Kuno group as well. Again, there we go, more performers. And this time, Debbie, it also have a little bit to do with the money making as well. <laughs> I wouldn't want us to talk about the pantomime and not mention some of the standouts, though, both in terms of performers and directors and choreographers. So we know we have spoken about uh, Rex Nettleford. But Eddie Thomas was a brilliant director. He was also um, the the costume, design. costume design, set design, musical director, director of the production. He did at least one production with doing everything, the, the yes. late Eddie Thomas. And then people like Jackie Guy also choreographed and danced in the pantomime. And then you, you have so many people who either cut their teeth on the stage of the, the war theater for pantomime or people like um, Sheila Rickards, a jazz, jazz singer. She performed in a pantomime, at least one that I'm aware of. Tocklin Jackson, oh. another cabaret and jazz singer. She performed in a pantomime. Uh, so I just want to mention Alma Marquien, Leonie Forbes, Carl Binger, Raymond Hill, he was in Music Boy when I entered the pantomime. Uh, and there are just many others. Martha Wiley did music, but she also performed. She was in Rational or Rational Fighting the Bull with a red cloth. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Pauline Stone Myrie, um, Faith Diagolo. I, I think it's important to mention some of these people so we don't lose them. And then there were behind the scenes people, stage managers like Audley yes. Colton. Audley Colton, amazing. Mr. Carter. No, for <laughs> Lighting was George Carter. I saw yes. George Carter live for about 4,000 years. Yes. He did the lighting at the for NDTC. He did the lighting yes. at the theater. There's Rufus McDonald, mm -hmm. you know, and then the many people. Front of the house, Miss. Um, Pardon? Millie. Front of house. Millie. Millie. Yeah. Millie. Yeah. Yeah. Millie. She used to um, work upstairs. Yes. With yeah. yeah. their Ferguson. There were just so many people who made that happen. The wardrobe mistresses, those who made the costumes. Yes, the people who, who made, designed and made the set. And when you speak about set design, I know that Michael Lord did that for many, many years. But before Michael, and I mean, he must never be forgotten. Before Michael, he like a man like Ed Thomas, Eddie Thomas, when he designed a set, you know. Mercy man. And there were several others. And then the people who directed, you see? It was a collaboration of coming together. It was a community. This is a whole community. community. We are. You thought about people like Dennis Scott. Yeah. And, you know, Noel Vaz. You know, Clyde Cunningham. Yes. And my goodness, there's a whole you know, people. I'm definitely hearing the, the community and that and how and how some of the people that you're naming how they branched off into um, Jamaican society beyond the arts, but how what they brought with them, um, their experience in the little theater movement, that um, cultural strengthening that they received in, um, in, in that process, um, how they essentially were decolonized and how they show up in other parts of our society. Um, and we're starting to see some some comments in the chat, but before we open up our Q and A, um, one such I just want to make some some other really great connections or lean into um, the subject of decolonize de decolonizing the art form and what Miss Lou really was able to achieve. Um, some of you may know one of her famous poems is um, "Colonization in Reverse." where she talks about Jamaicans going to England and pretty much taking up space in the way that the British came and took up space. The only difference is that economically and, and social and political dominance, that, that did not take place 
in England. Um, but I want to, there was a, a, a comment from one of our viewers, Irvine. Um, she asks about the, the, the impact on decolonization with the, the loss of some of our elders and, um, and the commercialization of the music. So it's interesting when we were putting the series together, we talked about Brand Jamaica puts out a certain um, aspects of Jamaican cultural identity. Um, and one aspect it doesn't really put forward is its colonial history. And that bridge across the colonial history that made reggae music and made, you know, um, Be The Man and Bounty Killer and all the ones that we celebrate on the brand Jamaica, Usain Bolt and, you know, all of these people that we celebrate, the, the bridging and the moving from colonialism to now made all of these people possible, but we don't talk about that colonial history. What happens when we are losing our our heroes. As an archivist, I want to toss this to you, and then I also want to would love to hear um, you, Faye, speak a little bit into this as well as Dr. Hickling Gordon. Debra, Debbie. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Anya. Um, well, I, I'm not so sure. Well, all right. Well, part of the thing about why we we are very conflicted about our colonial history, and and that has that it, it shows itself in many different ways because. Um, no one is pleased that there is a Queen Victoria statue in um, St. William Grant Park. And St. William Grant was a union man. He was a man who fought for the people. And he's, his park has Queen Victoria, who erroneously they sing a song that says Queen Victoria set us free. So um, <laughs> we are conflicted about that colonial history. But it's still there because there are bizarre things that will happen when you will have a poll and people say, well, we should have stayed with, with, um, with Britain and we should not have become independent because we don't know how to run things for ourselves. So we are conflicted about our colonial history, but the information is there if you choose to look for it. Um, the National Library, the Gallery, the Institute of Jamaica, the information is there, but maybe what needs to be done for us creatives is to find a way to work some of that information into how we can interpret it now, how we can see its relevance, its worth, whether it's something that we would rather reshape because of how it affected us negatively or how we can say this is how it affected us but this is how we worked through it and this is how we got to where we are because we believe very strongly in that when, when we have proverbs that say stand upon crooked and cut straight which means thing is not thing is not right but we're going to find a way to make it right donkey say the world no level because the donkey knows the weight on his back and he knows that he has to climb a hill but he's going to climb it anyway so we do look at we do look at some of those factors of our of our past, but we struggle with it and we struggle with it rightfully because we have so many con, you know contemporary issues with, with skin bleaching and not understanding the power of who we are and what we're about. Um, I'm sorry for those who like this new brand of trap dancehall music. We are trying to follow people who originally followed us. Um, rap came from toasting dancehall, um, and it came out of mental, it came out of reggae, it came out of rock steady. And we sometimes lose focus of where we're going. But the important thing is that we keep a sight of it. But it's up to some of us to keep reminding persons, which is something that we, we do to a point in the pantomime as well. We find little ways of putting things back into context. Um, and sometimes it's... Sometimes we don't realize that's what's being done, but when you dig a little deeper, you, you'll find the trend, you'll find the traits, you'll find the trends, you'll find the parts. But it's really just that conflict. Can we, because it's hard to embrace a time when they told you who you were, they told you what you were about. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a way to reclaim your history, reclaim yourself. And so that's really why we, we, we might not spend a lot of time on it. We know it's there. We know it's there. And we fight yes. against it every yes. day. Yes. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's um, coming no. out. It, it literally bubbles, it, it bubbles out. But we don't necessarily give it the um, pride of place that it ought to get. Yeah. Um, I spoke just like about a week ago at Caribbean Tourism. And it's amazing how the themes are the same. We're talk, we talk about sun, sea, sky, sex, sand, all of those etics. And we, in, instead of instead of talking about the culture and sharing the culture with ourselves and with our visitors, 
and it's about pride and it's about self-worth and there was a quotation that i used from amina blackwood meek that literally speaks to the notion of um our lives being a compendium of stories mm-hmm. and we need to tell the story mm-hmm. we need to package those stories and tell them with that sense of pride um and but some but a lot of it comes from the margin that the culture comes from the margin yeah and a lot of it comes naturally comes out naturally but we don't give it the pride of place that we should debbie perhaps what we're calling the margin is not the margin okay tell me about we're it we're calling the margin is what is dictating mm-hmm. and determining how we are viewed is it and up? we need to look <laughs> back at what we call the margin yes. because let us look at dance hall look at the popularity right. of dance hall not just in jamaica the caribbean but internationally right uh, and so we have to be very careful that we have not hurt ourselves got caught in a place mm-hmm. where we don't understand this the, the, the process of change to which you have referred and you spoke about retarded i don't quite agree with you there i think what has happened is that it has shifted and we don't even recognize what that word we need our feet we don't really some of us realize myself included maybe some of the times what is happening beneath our feet but you know i am a product of the i was born in the 50s i went to high school in the 60s then we had the the civil rights movement black power uh, women were viewed at, at that point stepping up and standing strong feminism came about and sometimes i ask myself between the 60s and the 70s something went wrong i ask myself that but clearly if something went wrong then maybe it's those of us who came up through that period who would not been able to uh, light that fire in the people who came beneath uh, after us to 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 move through with an understanding of the smartification who am i well when i i when i think wore our hair um in the 60s 70s, 70s with big afros natural hair and and wore head wraps and and caftans and all of these things and, and i think so, it bigger than us do you know auntie i think it is, that it is there, bigger than us you know yeah, because was a, the final point that De- debbie is that you know while we talk and talk and talk so we have our thing here that is what for me not really the margin it jump out gone big long time but we have cultural domination and penetration that has come out of the north north america mm-hmm. and so many people have do- that's a new colonization thank you please Absolutely. and it is coming through media products yes, movies that's- i'm not saying that we should watch your movies but i'm telling you movies cartoons videos uh, all of the shows that we get on cable television and for debbie or anya or i to develop get a concept and develop something and try to get it on local local television it is costly we understand that they have to pay their bills yeah. but it is costly so debbie i'm sorry i interrupted you there you want no 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 just- not at all i mean i think that globalization bubble that 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 emerged it 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 caused a lot of conditioning some of the things like i just said that we we didn't even see happening while it was happening but a great deal of conditioning happening happened happened during that period and and it has resulted i don't know if any of you have i don't know if and it's my advertising but watched a film called the social dilemma on yeah. on netflix yes, 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 which yes, tells yes. which tells and this is this, this is a situation that has been happening since world war <laughs> since world war communication so we've been conditioning our societies from that very very that very, very time you know but, um, and if you can just allow me to get it one of the things that, that we've been conditioning and many things happening mm-hmm. because when i started out in theater going to theater school or watching plays um in the 60s um they were all foreign scripts right there was uh, shakespeare and brecht and nothing wrong with that you know and chaucer mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that mm-hmm. and then because of this smartification and people start to find their footings and square up their shoulders and step up straight you had people who may not necessarily have come through and to mind but the thing rippled out ralph holness ginger knight balmer absolutely and then you right. come down like david heron and patrick brown and right Brandon. Oh, absolutely and absolutely and before that lot you had lloyd record bar record louis marriott because if you think louis about the dance play yeah if you think about the dance play ltm would have represented the establishment yes. ltm would have represented mm-hmm. the establishment so 
Balfour and 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 all the rest of it would have been those people who were knocking against Ralph Holness. I remember we used to when we used to talk about Ralph Holness, people's eyes would open. You but know, in, in the war theater, when the pantomime could not fill every seat in the war theater, he filled he it was, and the popped down and more every day. wanted more shows. Yes. And they were, they were they were playing seven well. nights a week. Can we can we contextualize a little bit for those who don't who don't, who may not know? Ralph Holness um, came. It, it it was termed roots theatre, and what it would be is exactly. it would be very bald. It would be uh, slackness according to the decent uptown people. Um, so it, it was very risque. Um, it was very low brow humor, they would say. But what it was, it was that it spoke to the people. It was a kind of jokes that you would tell in a bar. It's a kind of yes. jokes you're in the market. It's a kind of jokes that a higgler tell when she's on a plane flight to Panama to bring things back. So he, he was very powerful in the 80s and the 90s. And yes, it was, it was a kind of reaction and a cross current to the little theater movement. But I will tell you that there was still a linkage there because he looked at how the Little Theatre produced a show, how they had a set, how they had set changes, how they worked out different things, and he turned that to fit his own fashion. Mm -hmm. Indeed. To, to work his own way out of it, to decolonize from the more structured Act 1, Act 2, Act 3 kind of thing into, we could just take a look at bits and pieces and put it all together. And don't and forget, I'm learning it from in you know, Anna, Biman Bam, he started out with um, Biman Bam. Right, because there were a lot of these, these, these um, on the street, and in fact, um, Rani had a, what was called a traveling medicine show, which they would go from, from parish to parish selling things. So they would sell oil of this and ointment of that and the rest of that, which took him throughout the country. And this, so we began to understand how people could sell to people in different ways. And in a sense, that's, that's really what Ralph Holness was doing. He was selling this brand of theater to the common man so that they could feel that they could be a part of theater too. So when the uptown and, and, and the, the, the business, the business that yes, I remember. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what I remember. Well, let me. I'm going to jump in here a, a bit because this is this is really really excellent. What you're pointing <laughs> out, when you're pointing out all the ways that um, part of the decolonization of pantomime essentially is to is is where artists, Jamaican theater artists, identify the pantomime in its structure mm -hmm. um, as a tool. So in its structure, in its use of movement, in its use of language, utilizing the, the pantomime as a tool of resistance and also as a, a vehicle, um, a cultural, to, of forming a, a new cultural identity. You know, as I listen to the conversation, I'm, I'm reminded of last night when um, Kamala Harris walked on stage and she walked on stage to a Mary J. Blige song. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to not be emotional about um, the, the election and the outcome of the election. But for that moment as a creative, when she walked on stage in that white suit, as a, you know, the, the color of the suffragists to a Mary J. Blige song and in its work that and in the song, and you know, it's actually one of my favorite Mary J. Blige songs. It was not, wasn't until last night that I really listened to the words of the song and understood why that song was was uh, selected. And she says, you know, for for you women who are becoming, for for your beautiful skin color, that people are always pushing you to the side. And you know, I always like the song because of the beat. You know, it's a very great it's a great dance song work that thing you know it's got a nice hook to it but I hear that linkage in how um art and artists um you know as I watched her walk on stage I thought to myself wow look at where we've come and then you talk about the margins and you know that a lot of the people who are shifting the world today are the people from the margins. And I think that the margins are just getting bigger. Yes, you know, the margins are shifting, as, as Anthony said. I mean, speaking about, speaking about center and margins, I remember the time that I heard that Ralph Polis had moved into the world theater. <laughs> and the, theater, the entire theater community, it's like they completely exploded. I mean, everybody who had pearls clutched them. 
because it was it's a and, and so that was a process of decolonization right there. And mm -hmm. and, and every time there is a he knew what he was doing. He yeah. knew he would come by the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, whereas I was an announcer at the time, and he would talk because he wanted to place his ads, etc. He was scientifically, he worked it out. He was a strategist. And at yeah. one time he said to me, which I suspect he did to others, when I left the regular theatre, which is why don't you leave? A lot left? of people got that invitation. invitation. You get money, you're going to make money. And the truth and is, true, and I thought that I would have made money. And and the the people people any, any relationship to the current no, head of state? Not that I know. That I know. Why don't he learned the art from working with Bim and Bam. Am I correct there, Anil and, and Debbie? Um, so. goodness. But um, he, he, he built and he had, he had somebody who worked with him as a playwright. I don't want to misquote anything here. But he did these productions that, as Debbie said and Anil said, had, had appeal to a, a set of people who <laughs> under normal circumstances, those of us in traditional theater might look down on if you see them coming in. And they the were not necessarily coming to traditional theater. That's, right. That's right. right. And they wouldn't come because you they know, were unwelcome. You know, you know what, you know, that's a whole other, that's a whole other issue, you know. Hmm. There was, there was, there were these silos. Where are <laughs> these silos within theater? Silos mm -hmm. within the performances. Mm -hmm. The performers, mm -hmm. silos within the audiences. Mm -hmm. so there, there were all of these little groups. So there were people who were considered uptown there. There were people who were considered midtown there. There are mm -hmm. actors and actresses today who feel slighted because they couldn't get into the pantomime. Mm -hmm. There are actors yeah. and actresses today who who went the route of of of, of roots theatre and then go into what we now call commercial commercial theatre. And there right. are some people well, who from you know, and went into roots. Yes, right. absolutely. And and then we had and then now we have a, a kind of thin line where there there don't seem to be. I mean, I, I'm not active as active in theatre anymore, but the line lines seem to be blurred. <laughs> You bring up you bring up roots theater, which is a term that um, you brought up a, a few times. And next week's um, series is actually entitled "Jamaican Roots Theater Then and Now," and we're going to be talking with um, a very, a very, um, I would say, probably the face of Jamaican roots theater the world over at this time. It's Mr. Um, Keith Shibata Ramsey. Hi. And we will be joined by Marilyn Lowe for, for that conversation as well. One of the so just connecting us with roots theater, with kind of the, the then and now of our culture being formed locally in Jamaica and globally, um, the, the conversation of um, what is in the margins, how what is in the margin is actually what's telling the story. Okay. Is the center. The, the margin has become the center. The margin is the center. And the narrative, the, the actual narrative, the margin used to be the, 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 um, the postscript and the subscript and all of those things. But the actual narrative is now in the margins. We see it. We see it in the social movements around the world. Mm -hmm. And we see it in, in the way that Jamaican culture is, is emerging. I want to go back to this statement of... Um, the process of change and how, you know, if we, if listening to the conversation, I'm thinking that uh, the, 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 the pantomime came through, gave the culture a great, uh, for, helped to form a great cultural identity for Jamaican people. And then there, when I use the term sophistication, I'm more, I'm speaking of um, frequency. So then there becomes more other forms of, um, of theater practitioners and styles of theater that kind of mushrooms off of mm -hmm. the pantomime. And they, they take bits and pieces of it to create a, a new form. One of those forms um, emerging, in, becoming the, the roots um, theater uh, practice. As we look forward because we're moving now into our Q&A and we have a question from Brian Heap 
in the chat. Mm -hmm. And the question surrounds um, what is, as we, as we move forward in this time, what is the way forward for the pantomime in this post-colonial age? And I'm actually going to put something else on it. What is the way forward for the pantomime in a post-colonial era where globalization, because in a globalization, climate change, pandemics, for example, economics, <laughs> e e say that again, economics, economics. <laughs> so for example, for this is uh, the, the, the pantomime has ran for 78 years, Anya, and for the first um, time in 78 years, there will not be a live performance. So what is, what happened? How do we vision forward? What is the vision forward for the pantomime in this did you, era? Did you see me, did you see me crying? I'm, I'm just trying to get through 2020. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is, this is really something that we're, we're all going to have to work on how we approach live entertainment in, in this, this pandemic era and how we get forward from here um so it's almost like whatever you had planned as your next step is totally short-circuited because we now have to figure out how do we how are we going to survive with um social distancing mask wearing um restrictions to sizes it's interesting to note that like for instance in europe um it's um, where they, 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 they had a performance where they, they got in the gondolas and they watched a, um, a, a show being screened on a, on, a, on a building wall. So mm -hmm. they were able to bring theater into, into a space that never really existed in just to make sure that it happened. And we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to seriously work out how we, how we keep that because I'm a, I'm a backstage person. So for me, there's nothing more glorious than watching persons come into the space. And when the lights go down around them and they're sitting shoulder to shoulder with somebody else and they everybody might say, you hear what them just say and they giggle and say, you see that person around the back and how they're reacting to that. That kind of interaction, which made change, it freaks me out because yeah. for me, that the excitement of theater, movies are movies. Theater is about the communion of persons who are around you. It's the link between the person on stage and off stage. It's that point when the actor looks into the audience and makes eye contact with that person and knows that they have sold that role and they are into that moment. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that in, in a COVID era? And Daniel, honestly, don't get know. Creative. Let me tell you. Yeah. When I did my master's program, I did it late in life because I was busy performing and teaching at the university. And my thing was on the teledramatic arts. And that is what mm -hmm. it has come down to now. We can't manage the floorboards alone. Mm -hmm. We have to take it elsewhere. We have to use the technology mm -hmm. to take the product uh, to our larger audience. As a matter of fact, I'm going to use, uh, a f uh, I'm going to draw a parallel with church. I have not been to church from March, right? And many people have, but, the, but there is the service happening. L please understand mm -hmm. that there's a larger congregation now oh. than there would have been if you were contained in that space of church. But I could I just also speak about Brian Heap. For those persons who don't know, Brian Heap worked with a little theater movement and directed several pantomimes. I know you might be having him on in a series, already had him on, he but I'm to put him in context, right? So Brian understands this, this, this thing. And I want to also say, and this could be, um, could get me the trouble. There are some things that we have just not yet considered how to decolonize where pantomime is coming from. What are some of those things? If you want to share one. There are some things that, you see, when you inherit something such as how the pantomime started, there and they have moved away beautifully in some ways. But in, I, I can't even tell you that there it is specifically this or that. What I can tell you, and Anya has the burden of that now, mm -hmm. uh, which is the way things the way things have gone, uh, have been a little problematic in terms of the business side that Debbie is talking about. It's you not know her fault. It, yes, yes, Debbie. It is the way things, and, and that is you have to understand now. The the the, the let me call it is when people started doing theater first, it was for the love of it. 
that was for the novel. And so they, they, that, is a, that is part of what um, I'm speaking about. No, you can't do something if you're not being paid because mm -hmm. people have to live. You have to drive your car to go to rehearsals. You have to eat, right? But when it first started, they would give you a little stipend. Mm -hmm. It was for the love of it. So you were not forced, the, the producers uh, in this case, to draw up a serious business plan and mm -hmm. move with it. Mark you. Not very many financiers support the arts, so we know the challenge with that. That is why we have to think really creatively and creatively. Okay, so we so, so we we hear about the the need to um, look at the the different platforms for presenting theater as far as um, styles, location. We hear about the economy of pre presenting um, theater. Um, how do you sustain a workforce in the Jamaican theater? Um, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna definitely get to you, um, Deb, um, but I just wanted to bring up one, one point here regarding the, the narrative. I think all of these things, um, all of these things are to be considered. How will theater change physically? Where will we go to see the theater? I'm, I'm very, um, excited that people keep wanting to go to the theater. It shows just how important theater is, not just um, film. And, and also that, that itch and that need and that wanting for theater to be, as you said, Anya, in, in space, to share space with, um, with other people, that communal need that theater provides. And definitely needing to look at what are the economic structures and opportunities there. Another thing, as, as I throw this to, uh, to Deborah and definitely share your point, is what happens to the story of the Jamaican people? How does, what are the opportunities there? How does the story of the Jamaican people show up on the stage at the pantomime when it reopens again? Are, are new stories formed? How is, how, what, what myths, what myths will emerge from this era onto the pantomime stage, just like the Anansi myths and the, the, the pig myths and oh, all these, where, where is the myth. that myth that will emerge onto the pantomime stage? Deborah. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> we only got four minutes <laughs> as yes. we wrap up. So I just want to respond to Brian Heap. Brian Heap is a man who sit down and watch opera and go to the, go to, um, the palace amusement and watch opera being broadcast live from um, from Russia at particular times into into Jamaica. So he's a man who knows exactly how we need to to, to move the convergence. What we need to be doing is converging the the, the, the media, the, the the various media, so that we can um, show the um, the show a film. So we can have a live production being filmed in a way that it can be shared by hundreds and of thousands of people. I saw the gondola thing, the thing you saw, I saw that in, in, um, in, in Colombia, where there was a live performance, but it was being shot in a way that it was being projected on a huge wall in, um, mm -hmm. on, in, a, in a fort. And um, I told that, that story to the CTO as well. It's about converging the elements and that's where the story goes. Mm. So you are now starting to integrate the heritage. You're starting mm. to integrate the media. You're mm. starting to integrate the production. You're starting to integrate the, the theatrics. But it takes mm. a vision and it takes a policy and it takes cooperation and it takes planning and it takes management. And I'm going to jump in and just try and, 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 and do all of what you just said in a free plug. So this year um, on Boxing Day, we're going to be um, doing a virtual concert, which is like bits and pieces from previous pantomimes inspired by what's happening now and um, drawing on our pieces from the past. So it's, it's a kind of review sort of situation. And one of the things that we want to do, because every year after the Christmas opening, when there's a slower period, we host children's homes. Normally they come and they watch the show and these are kids who don't have a chance to come to many places. And what we want to do with that same production that we plan to air on Boxing Day December 26th 
is we want to take that recording and go into the homes so that they can still see it, so that they can still be a part of it. So they're not left out of this in this COVID, this COVID madness. And we're seeking sponsorship, so call me. But Anya, yeah, you want to take it to the homes and I, I applaud that. But how outside of the seeking sponsorship, how do you intend to make the business side of it work for you in terms of maybe a YouTube channel or something like that? We are on YouTube, we have the social media. So we are, we are looking, we are working those areas. Um, of course, it can be worked better. And that's part of what's going to be happening with, as we prepare for this virtual concert that we're doing. We're looking at options that we have. But as you said, the real difficulty is that it's really very hard to do some of these things when you just don't have the, the funding that you want. And um, unfortunately for, um, for corporate Jamaica, they don't want to spend money on some of these things. They want to spend something on an easy thing. Uh, it's branding. Kind of very hard. It's not so there's an opportunity, you know, one of, one of the things that I can see is that, you know, I remember when Miss Lou turned, I think she turned 80. And um, there was a big celebration for her, um, at, I believe, at Jamaica House on the lawn. And all of the, um, the, the artists performing. And I remember um, Beanie Man, who is a Jamaican reggae record, the king of dancehall. Um, you know, there are many crowns and he wears one of them. And um, he was uh, singing and celebrating Miss Louise Bennett. And I thought, wow. There's another country. Yeah. I wouldn't have made that connection there. That's, so, that's what so, that will get people out. Yeah, so I'm enough. just gonna I'm just gonna start to wrap us up only because we are at the close of time. But one um, and I'll 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 toss it to you, Faye, for a last term, but last word. But before we go, um, just to close us out at this time, you know, there what I'm hearing is that the pantomime, what's really unique about this art form in Jamaica is its ability to respond to the times, its ability in its form to respond to the current times and respond to the, the, the process of change and identity and um, formation of narrative and to create that on that stage and then to, to move it out, whether it's other actors and directors and designers and producers who work on the pantomime stage and then go off and do their own thing. Um, later on in the conversation, I think in the next three or four weeks, we, we're, we're going to be speaking with um, some, we have that, in a, in a few weeks, the um, series is titled Leaders of a New Stage, and where we will be speaking with some of the next generation leaders, managers, directors, producers. And it will be interesting to hear what, uh, what part of their aesthetic, what part of their vision, the, um, where the pantomime lives in their collective memory and how that is influencing and forming their work. Um, before we go, I do want to, uh, you talk about a plug, Anya. I'd like to ask uh, Deborah to plug her book. There's a wonderful oh. book that she, if you have it on hand and you want to put it up in front of the screen. Around oh, I, hadn't, I, I had not prepared to do that, but That's okay. um, it's coming up towards the end of the year. Um, it's the cultural economy on television, decolonizing, um, decolonization uh, 2.0. So it really talks about the cultural economy as a catalyst for decolonization going forward into the 21st century. Exactly. And, and it hasn't been published yet, correct? It's or coming out this month or next month. So in, okay, excellent. So as we close out, um, say, I'll let you say uh, your, express your final thoughts and then I'll wrap, wrap us up. You asked the question about what will the Jamaican stories be for the pantomime. The pantomime will not be short on Jamaican stories because whatever happens becomes a Jamaican story. Oh, yeah. So it's just the time the playwright and they are set, right, to put it together. So Anna is not worried about how we're going to plan a story, not out there to do with COVID, to do with flooding, to do with everything, to do with the economy, to do it, to do with um, Biden and, 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 and bring it back in because she have a Jamaican. No story out there. But I quickly want to comment on that you were a little surprised when you heard Beanie Man connected with Miss Lou. Most of our Zegge artists 
and dancehall artists and dub poets speak about Miss Lou opening the door with the language for them. Miss Lou opened that door because they're not singing in English, you know. They're not, they're not singing like this. They're not singing like Jamaican language. And I'm going to tell them story. It's a story. It is a story. Each song is a story. Each piece is a story. So each of them, you think of people like Linton Tracy Johnson. You think of, of, of um, Ras, 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 Safari, right? And you think of others. They tell you, and the, and the reggae artists, the influence of Miss Wu on their lives. So let us understand that she opened the door with the, the opportunity for the acceptance of language for not just a few performers, but for the nation. There is a language unit at the Jamaica, at the University of the West Indies. It's not a dialect unit, it's not a Creole unit. It's not a, a it's a Jamaica language unit held in the Jamaican words. And for those who don't know, the New Testament of the Bible was also written using the Jamaican language. Yes. Uh-uh. Me have to get my chocolate tea and come talk to you about that one. Day. Arena, <laughs> <laughs> chocolate tea and Johnny cake and roast. Try two dumplings and come oh. and come talk to you about. You know, it's interesting that you say that as we close out because I've, I've lived in the in in the U.S. for uh, since I was a very young child, and one of the things that has sustained me actually. Anya, you said two proverbs that I live on: stand on crooked and cut straight. And um, that one I, I got from my grandmother, and then the donkey one I got from my aunt. You know, and I tell you, growing up, growing up, you know, you in in, in a foreign country. Well, this is more um, growing up in the, in a culture different from the culture you were born in or um, came to be in. Uh, you need these these these. Proverbs at times, and I and I'm very grateful for them because they do help to keep us grounded. Um, yes, yes. You can hang on to and you can hang on to that. Monkey must know which part he must put in tail before other trousers. Do that one again. Say that one again. Monkey must know which part he must put in tail before other trousers. Okay, the monkey must know. For planning. And strategizing, and you have to know your circumstances. Because you can't go put on pants if you and you have tail. You go where you go do with the tail. You go make one hold the drive through. You go push your pocket. You go wrap around the waist. Where you go do? Monkey must know which part you go put in tail before you other throws it. Well, uh, and, and the truth is that we don't know what's going to happen. Everybody is in a quandary right now. So everybody, right. I try to sort out them tail. That's right. <laughs> so, as we try to sort out our tail, as I said. Measure twice, cut once. Um, yes. That's another one. <laughs> we think about language, and we're grateful for the little little theater movement, for the pillars, Ronnie Williams and Miss Louise Bennett Coverly, for the ways that the work of the little theater movement has evolved throughout Jamaican culture in its music, in its mores, in its fashions. Um, we are very, very grateful for that. And we will continue. We will build on this conversation next week when we talk about the Jamaican Roots, the Jamaican Roots Theater, then and now. We, we will be speaking with Keith Shibata Ramsey and Marilyn Lowe, two very prominent actors on the uh, Jamaican Roots Theater stage um, at this time. And um, I'm a big fan of Shibata. I'm always there for... Um, pinch off Fridays and Happy Corner Live and getting all of that rooting and grounding because I have to keep my Jamaican, I have to keep my Jamaican strong, you know, and I brush up on my language every now and then. All right. So thank you all so much for tuning in. We hope that this has been not just an educational experience for the scholars and um, for the people looking into this with questions. What can we learn from this part of the world? But we also hope that it's been a nice, warming, connecting touch points for the diaspora, for those who want a little bit of home while we're so far apart. Listen, walk good. Walk good on is, is a term we say in Jamaica. It's a it's a it's it's not a farewell, it's just a walk good, be well in life. And we theater people, we say see you on the boards. So I've put it together. Walk good on the boards here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.